our uh, next scripture lesson comes from Matthew's gospel, but I want to share a little bit of context with you before we read it. Early on in chapter 13 in Matthew, Jesus has gone beside the lake to start teaching, and this is happening on the same day that in chapter 12, the Pharisees uh, proclaim that Jesus is casting out demons by being in allegiance with them. So he's really tired of that, and he goes off to the lakeside, and a large crowd gathers, and he tells them a series of parables, and we're going to focus on two of them today. So hear these words from Matthew's gospel. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in the gathering of the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers to collect the weeds first and then bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn." He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Sometimes the teachings of Jesus seem so very clear. Sometimes they are meant to be as simple as the kingdom is like a mustard seed. And we think we understand what that means. Because as I showed the children, it is so very small. Jesus often uses uh, parables, illustrations, stories, that help the people around him to understand a particular point about God's kingdom. But here's the challenge for you and me. We know a lot less about ancient Near Eastern farming techniques than the people who Jesus was actually talking to do. I can't grow a thing. Trust me, if you ever assumed that I could, I cannot. Even the easiest of plants, I'm sure, would die if I tried to plant them. So we need to take the time to really dive into what Jesus is actually saying because it is much more complicated than it might first appear. Because we don't have that same context. Because we don't live in the ancient Near East and we don't always know their farming techniques. One of the most important things that was grown in the ancient world was wheat. This is because they predominantly have a bread-based diet. We don't really advocate for bread-based diets anymore. There's all kinds of diets that say maybe we should have a little less wheat, maybe a little less bread. But in the ancient world, this is their life. So it is really important 
that there is a lot, a lot of wheat. And in the ancient world, especially in the Near East, it's an arid climate. Not everything will grow there. And so every piece of crop is really important to them. They have worked tirelessly to ensure its growth and its well-being. And that's where we have to start with the wheat and the weeds. There's a lot at stake in this field that the landowner has gone and put good seed in his field. But somehow, some way, there are weeds among the wheat. Now, I grew up in a family where my grandparents gardened, particularly my grandfather gardened, and he would spend time picking weeds, particularly early in the season, around this time of year, so that the nutrients, the miracle grow that we might put on the garden would not cause the weeds to grow, but the green beans to grow, the watermelons to grow, the strawberries to grow. That was really important. But here's the thing. We could tell what was a strawberry and what was a dandelion. We could tell what we hadn't planted. So the first thing we have to ask is how can we distinguish between the wheat and the weeds? And here's the hard part. In the ancient world, they couldn't tell the difference in between the most common of weeds and the wheat. Because the weed that would grow most easily looked exactly like the wheat until it was harvest time. When the wheat would change color and you would be able to see what it was. So up until then, it would grow, the weed would grow as a stalk and it would even have kernels like the wheat and you wouldn't know what it was. And so when Jesus tells this story of a farmer who has a field that is full of wheat and weeds, no one can tell what's what. So in the process, if the, if the servants would go and weed out the field, undoubtedly some of the life preserving food would be lost. Here's the first lesson that Jesus tells us about the kingdom. We do not know. We may not be able to discern. We may not have the wisdom always to tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. We may not know what is always good for us. We may not know what is going to bring life and what is going to suck that life away. We cannot always know. That is not a perspective that we always have. And so sometimes the right response as the servants of our master is to say, we're going to let God worry about that later. Sometimes the right response isn't, we need to weed this out right now. We need to have this issue resolved today. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to wait for the time of the harvest. 
Now, second part of the story that you may not have originally picked up on is that the harvest is frequently used by Jesus as a, um, as a story, an illustration, an allusion to when the end of history is going to come, when the final judgment for all things will come to pass. That might be a long time in the future. So when we say that's not our job, that's what I mean. When we say we're going to wait for God to sort it all out, we could be waiting for a very long time. So don't take that burden on yourself. It's not your job to discern between the wheat and the weeds. And it never has been. So, Jesus tells a second parable, and this one might be even more unclear to us than the first. Even though it is so simple, and I just did exactly what my pastor did when I was a little kid. I got out a mustard seed, or maybe a jar full, and I showed it to the little children in the same way that my pastors did for me. And I did the same thing they did and commented to them how small it is. And then my pastors growing up would say, it only takes a little bit of faith. It only takes a little bit of hope. It only takes this much of the gospel to come into our lives and it changes everything. And all that's perfectly true and good. But you know what they never taught me? Something I'm sure that they've never taught you. Mustard is a weed. Doesn't that change the story a little bit? Mustard is an invasive plant. Mustard would take over your entire garden if you had just one seed take root. Just one. So people would do anything they could to keep mustard out of their neighborhood, out of their town, out of their gardens, out of their fields. Because if the mustard seed came in, it would take over everything. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, and then he says, and someone sowed it in their garden, in their field. Something's already sticking out to those first century hearers. Because that is not something we would do. Because one little grain of mustard would take over your entire life. Mustard is a powerful thing. And I don't just find that out because I go down to the hot dog, hot dog shop and get it on my smoked sausages. It is tangy and delicious. Mustard isn't just powerful because in World War I it was used to process mustard gas, which then would be used as a weapon. By the way, still a substance that's frowned upon use. Mustard is powerful because of its capacity to grow. Its capacity to come into someone's life, someone's field, and take all the way over. Its capacity to grow and change from the smallest thing to the thing that occupies all of your life and time. God's kingdom is like a mustard seed. But instead of spending all of your life trying to keep it out, Jesus says, we're going to plant it on purpose. And we're going to let it take over. 
And then it will go from the smallest of the seeds. We have strawberries now. They have smaller seeds. But it will grow into the largest of the shrubs, and then birds of the air will come and make nests in its branches. Hmm. Other versions of this parable go, and birds of the air will come and rest in its shade. So when the kingdom grows within us, because we're the field, right? When we make the effort to plant it in our heart, the kingdom grows within you, and you should not expect it to be contained. You should not say, there's part of my life that the kingdom shouldn't have a part of. Because that doesn't really work. That's not how invasive this kingdom really is. But when the kingdom grows within you, all of a sudden it doesn't stay small. It grows, and then all of a sudden, birds of the air come and make nests in its shade. So when the kingdom, or the evidence of the kingdom, that your kingdom is growing in you, is all of a sudden, you end up collecting people. People in your life that have nowhere else to go. People in your life who are tired and weary from many things in this life that will cause them to need a place to rest and a place to be. I imagine this image all the time when I think of the church. It's probably one of the ones I think of most. Because what would our churches look like if our churches were filled with people who needed rest? Who needed a place to be because there is nowhere else for them to go? Where people might come and experience grace and restoration and healing from a world that has wearied them. We had a word for this in the Middle Ages. We called it sanctuary. In the ancient world, while all of the land might belong to the king, the one exception to that was the church. The church belonged to God, and so people would come to the church, even if they were a people who were on the run for something wrong that they had done, they would knock on the door and they would ask the priest for sanctuary. And the priest would offer it back to them. And so then, as long as they stayed within the property of the church, no earthly authorities could come and take them. They had a security and a place where they could be, where they could grow. And the reason for this is because the church belongs to God and it doesn't belong to any of us. And so the church came to represent the kingdom and a place for people to come and rest and be. Friends, I could want nothing more for your church than to be like the mustard seed. I could want nothing more for each of you to have that seed planted in your life so that it might take all the way over and people might find their sanctuary in you. No matter what they have experienced that has wearied them in this world. And we got some things in Allegheny County that can make you weary. 
We got issues. Plenty of them. We got issues in Virginia. We got issues in the United States. We have issues for being human. In which all of us occasionally need a place to just be. And if not here, where else would the kingdom grow? Where else might people come and just be? So in wrapping up, how might we reflect the kingdom that says... We don't need to sift through wheat and weeds. Our job is to provide a place for the kingdom to be planted and then to be that place where the weary might come and find rest. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask and pray that through the power and work of your Holy Spirit, we might fully embrace the teachings of your Son, and that we might allow your kingdom to grow within us, so that your world might better reflect the kingdom you have desired. May each of us experience the faith that grows like the mustard seed. May we all collect those who are weary in the world and provide shelter in who we are and in the grace we have received. May we extend that grace to others so that grace might grow from one field to the next, from one garden to the next, from one person to the next. May all of us live and grow in that grace now and forever. Amen.